So hello, as the first slide says, my name is Natalia and I'm a front end developer. Um, I'm here from New York where it is currently almost 5 a.m. So thank you for the coffee, it is doing its job. Um, so I'm a front end developer and I'm a fine artist. And if you're thinking like a canvas, a brush, an easel, that's exactly the kind of artist that I'm talking about. Now I thought I was actually gonna have to have a little bit of a longer intro of why a painter would be standing here at a tech conference talking to a bunch of people who code. But actually Harry's talk did a great job uh, setting me up for this because he said let's learn from the last 30, 40, 50 years of programming and apply it to your CSS and I'm up here telling you let's learn from the entire combined history of human pursuit of the arts and apply it to CSS. So this is practical color theory for people who code and let's get started. This is not about you. So when photography emerged in the painting dominated art world, uh, it was quickly denounced as just being mere documentation. The camera is nothing more than a piece of technology wielded by people whose artistic intent and creative skill is inconsequential. Painters were very quick to say, if you are a photographer, you are not an artist. A real artist uses a brush, and a canvas or sculpts on marble, but you are decidedly not artists. Does it feel like history is repeating itself with developers and designers where you are told you are decidedly not creative, you are not artistic, you are just working on a cold piece of machinery? Maybe. So when, when I quit teaching, and doing art and fine art and painting and went to full-time front-end development, I fell victim to the same false dichotomy. People asked me, how can you stand stopping being creative and artistic and working on computers? How can you stand giving up all this creativity and artistry to go work on computers? And that's at the point where I felt like, I know how these photographers must have felt. These photographers, really were hurt by this because they understood the work they were doing was creative, just like I understand that the work we do on the web is incredibly creative, because think about it. The internet and the canvas that we are working on changes size, changes shape, it glows at you in any color that you wish. You use it to shape ideas front end, you may make those ideas visual, in the back end, those ideas may remain in the abstract, but you shape your ideas to create an experience that connects people across time and space. Yes, I was really going to miss being creative, no longer working with a stick with some hair on the end of it and mushing goop around to paint because I was gonna be working on computers. It just didn't make sense because if you create on the web, you are creative and the web is your medium. That is the new cool thing that we are working on today. So all of the lessons that I'm gonna talk about from the fine art world absolutely apply here. Um, now the problem here that I see is that I've seen a lot of developers say, whoa, that's not for me, that's, that's, for, that's for you, that's for artists. Um, something as simple as picking a color for a project, it, it, it's the thing that absolutely drives drives developers away from it, because think about it, it's really hard work. There's absolutely nothing stopping you from doing a terrible job. There's no compiler that's gonna mess up if your colors cra crash. Um, you're gonna have a terrible time if you think that your tests are gonna fail when your colors don't look so good and your client does, doesn't like them. And it's incredibly vulnerable work. There's nothing stopping you from hearing, you know what, that looks ugly, um, make it better. I don't know what to do, just make it pop, just do something else, this is terrible. And it's, it's gonna hurt your feelings because if, if you think you're starting somewhere simple, like yeah, I'm just gonna pick some colors for this app that I built, you're actually doing something very difficult and you're probably gonna get really discouraged from it. So motivational speech aside, I just wanna make sure that everybody knows that this vague and random frustrating thing, like picking a color scheme, 
is actually a very studied, logical, and predictable thing. Like, we've had this stuff available as artists for a really, really long time. We've studied color as a social thing. We've studied color in terms of wavelengths and how it works and how our eyes work. But unfortunately, that really hasn't jumped over to the web very much yet. Um, so that's what I'm here to talk to you about, is how to make that cognitive shift into understanding and thinking about color as information rather than this just frivolous decoration that somebody just made up and you have to be a unicorn with a sixth sense to be able to wield this like an artist. Um, every single person here who works with patterns, abstractions, and logic and reason can absolutely learn to do this if that's something you're interested in. So there's no divide keeping you from doing this. And that's a very important thing that I always have to say ahead of time because some people don't even want to listen to this because they think like, oh, I failed once, it was terrible, I'm never putting myself out there again. So I can't fit all of art school and design school into a short one hour talk. But what I can do is get, introduce the tool that you already have, which is you have SAS, the good preprocessor that allows you to do things. You have CSS, which has a lot of this with HSL color spaces working with you, uh, working for you. And I want you to see and understand the design decisions that designers and artists make as they create color schemes and to see that you can wield color decisions with intent. You can create color schemes with intent and you can stop picking colors at random and then wondering why it doesn't work. Um, so if you're a designer or you, you land on the more design side of things, the front end, you should be very satisfied with the fact that I've abstracted away a lot of the decisions you make and people should absolutely respect how many decisions you make in any given moment. If you are on closer to the back end side of things, you should absolutely see that the work that you do is very similar to the work that designers do. It's just different. It's not, um, there's a lot of overlap here. But it all boils down to one really, really important fact. Color is information. And as developers, we know what to do with that. We use information, we shape ideas, we do this all the time. So again, if you've ever picked colors at random, you don't have to do that anymore because the way we perceive color and what color does for us and the information that color is, is not random. So. Let's talk about the purpose of color then. Let's go to it. Okay, so we can go all the way back to nature and say color can help us find food such as red berries against a green patch of leaves or it can help us escape scary predators when they, we see them coming for us and immediately I see everybody bored like yes, cool, we know that. I learned this in kindergarten. How does this actually help me when I'm making a website? I have a deadline, I have clients, I have to do this work. I need to pick some colors. What do I do? So let's take a look at a website. Oh my god, it's too bright. Uh, <laughs> this is obviously an investment banking website. That, oh, just kidding. It is a website for kids. We all immediately see this is PBS Kids, and this is a website aimed at children. What are the two key giveaways about this? It's super bright. It is the brightest, brightest color that you can think of. I even like put some white and dark around it just so I can handle it on this slide. It's got hot pink, lime green, really, really bright blue. And here's the thing, we associate bright colors with childhood, right? As a society, we're like, yeah, bright colors, childhood. Kids love neon colors, this is great. Um, but there's also the other fact that factors into this is that, well, because also, uh, scientifically speaking, not just socially that we associate color, bright colors with children. Bright colors, why are kids attracted to bright colors? A lot of research says it's because young kids seek out bright, the most exciting stimuli to help their brains develop. So it's never just one biology or just society deciding what we see, what, what information color has for us. It's a combination of several factors. Now, this is where it kind of gets iffy. That's where a lot of talks get kind of, that I've seen on color, get a little bit distracted because there are a lot of really cool facts. Like, again, did you know that kids seek out bright stimulus because that's what helps their brains develop? Or that kids don't like beige because they can't actually differentiate different hues from each other as well as people can in older age. Um, or for example, I could go into a whole speech about why bl pink and blue to separate genders is actually a very, persistent 
advertising campaign from the 1940s that's just stuck. It's not something that we were born with, separating boys into blue and girls into pink, but now we can't help but associate those things with those colors. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff that's also really un not understood yet and still being researched. For example, did you know that there is a statistically significant correlation between wearing the color red and winning in contests of strength? That's why I wear a red scarf during these talks. Uh, there's also a serious, uh, you know, bunch of research that's saying blue is calming, and if you want your kids to learn better in an environment, paint your classrooms blue. And it just seems, again, really random, kind of cool, and the kind of stuff that makes talks interesting for about five minutes until you realize, I have to build a project, I have a deadline, and you're still talking about this. So let's go to the science of it. I'm gonna skip over the social, this is how colors make us feel, or like red makes you feel like it's aggressive, don't make your website red because we want it to look expensive, so make it purple. Like That's not what I'm gonna talk about here. I'm gonna talk about science and wavelengths and the stuff that you learn in art school once you're out of the intro classes, that color is light. It is our perception of this tiny little slice of the electromagnetic spectrum, and that's what we are perceiving. It's just information, and that's how we choose, interpret it with our eyeballs. Um, and so there's that little slice that, that we understand. And what I find is that what you can find in an art school library and the resources available to people studying the arts are so much more amazing than the resources that we have on the internet. If you just do a quick Google search or if you're a developer trying to stumble upon these randomly, you're probably not gonna have much luck. Um, but then if, at the same time, if you, if you go to the art school library and say, you know what, I'm building this project, I'm gonna meet this deadline, I'm gonna go to the art school library and read these books, well, that's stuff is really good information, but it also needs updating and translating. You're gonna come up against things like how to read the color wheel. You should have all learned how to do that in school, right? No, you're gonna find that the documentation in the art books is not very semantic. Uh, there's a color called ivory black. Is it white or black? You just have to know. And they're also gonna rely on a lot of prior knowledge that's got terrible naming conventions. So for example, if you don't know the difference between ultramarine blue and thalocyanide blue, you're in for a world of trouble when you're trying to make colors happen and you try to mix them up. And then finally, it's a very distracting thing too because once you go down the rabbit hole of learning about art history and painting, you'll get distracted with things like, did you know there's a paint called mummy brown that was actually made out of crushing up mummies? to make paint. You can't not go to Wikipedia and start Googling that and finding out the history of that. You'll never actually get through to figuring out color theory for yourself. My favorite art resource is a book from the 1940s and I haven't really found much since. Um, and so this is where a lot of this information is gonna come for, from. So finally, with that all of the way, let's do it. Let's take a look at Oh wait, pop quiz. What's the relationship between FF1500 and 00EAFF? Raise your hand if you know the answer to this. There's always one. One poor soul in the audience who knows, and I'm so sorry if it's you. Yes. Yeah, I'm so sorry that you know that. Yeah, so this is, this is the problem. There's always one person in the audience who has taken it upon themselves to internalize hex values, and they understand what these are. Yes, these are indeed complementary colors. They are opposite each other on the color wheel, and the fact that you can look at these and know what those are, like I wish I had a prize for you, I'm sorry. Um, the problem here is that it's not that this information is terrible. I absolutely love colors. Like, I love Misty Rose, Goldenrod, Thistle, Papaya. I love FF8DC. I love F5, F5DC. I love RGB0255127. That is a gorgeous color. But these aren't really made for people, right? We were just in this talk, and Harry talked about how, like, this should be written for people. Software should make, be, make making people's lives better. At the end of the day, I don't care if that's what the computer needs, but what we need is a way better way to deal with color in our projects. Like if you're still looking at hex values and you're trying to read them, you're making this unnecessarily difficult on yourself, especially because we now have the CSS color level three color module that has HSL color spaces and that's 
made just for you, for developers, and it's actually an answer to RGB. It's something that's going to be making your lives easier as front-end developers so that it can be intuitive. It can be something that you, you're able to create relationships between colors and not just have this sea of hex values, RGB values, that are just kind of put some variables on them and hope these colors work together. It's, again, it's, it's so random, it's so strange. So here's my little little whiteboard here. We're going to talk about the color wheel. We're going to talk about color relationships, and I'm going to show you an example of how to build a complementary color scheme, which is just the classic one that everybody really likes, and we're going to use HSL to do this. So if you get nothing else out of this talk, it's that you should be using the HSL color space, which is hue, saturation, and lightness, which encompasses three qualities of color, not just the hue part, the H part. Um, and so the first thing you need to know before I get into the rest of this is that a color wheel is not a color line. It's a color wheel because it's kind of like self-documenting code. You're supposed to know how to read it, but boy, some documentation for our documentation would have been great. Um, what I'm going to show you is that how you can use this color wheel to, and then I, I'm going to show you how to use this color wheel to intuitively select colors and then build a series of color relationships so that your application is going to look pretty good no matter what. We're going to do one example and it's going to show you that there's a pattern and a logic to this that is just easily abstracted into a bunch of functions and all of my unicorn designer knowledge that I just have to, you know, it's like my talent. Or, it's just a bunch of decisions that I make that you can be, a, you can abstract into functions. So please, as you see this demo, I hope that it helps you stop building, picking colors at random, and so you can start building your, your variables partial in your SAS like you build the rest of your application. Because how are we still doing color variables? Just kind of stacking them at the bottom like CSS style. We just one more color, just add another color at the bottom of the style sheet instead of building a system, a comprehensive system that you can work in um, and, and maintain over time. So demo time, let's do this. And I'm going to switch to optimizing for this projector, apparently. Aha. So this is practical color theory. This is a little demo that I created. And what are you looking at right now? It should be totally immediately apparent that we have a call to action and an invisible mouse. So it's a themed website where I created one set of rules with a bunch of functions, and you can pick any color on the color wheel, and it will work. It'll theme the rest of the site, and you pick your call to action color, and it'll, it'll work. It's just one set of rules for all the colors. So take a look at this, and I'm going to walk you through the decisions that I made and see what patterns emerge. But before we get too into it, let's... I'm going to pick red. I like red. If anybody has a color preference, just shout it out. Um, here's a color wheel. Right? What is a complementary color? I keep saying the word complementary. And again, I keep assuming that these are things like, oh, of course, coming from the art world, this is common knowledge, right? It doesn't seem to be. A complementary color scheme just means that you have two colors that are 180 degrees apart on the color wheel. They're just opposite each other. And you know you have a complementary color when you can say things like, it's a bluish yellow or a reddish green, and that doesn't make sense to your brain. You're like, no, those are opposites. You, you've never seen a reddish green or a bluish yellow. That just doesn't happen. So that's just a standard color scheme that works. Why does it work? Well, because they're opposite wavelengths that cancel each other out, and your eyeballs really like the contrast. We're still kids at heart, and we try to seek out things that are different so we can look at them. So what this starts with is you pick two colors opposite each other on the complementary colors on the on the color wheel. And the reason you want to use HSL is because it perfectly corresponds to the degrees on the color wheel from 0 to 360 degrees with 30 degrees between major colors. Immediately you can have the color wheel in your mind and you can pick any color right away. You don't have to just decide like, okay, I need this much R red, this much green, and this much blue, and try to mix it in your head. This is already done for you, right? The, the H in HSL is for hue, which is another word for color. And 0 to 360, you've done it. You've picked a color, and you can move on. So here, we have selected a nice orange. And right next to it, you see your layout. If you have now applied orange 
or I guess it's red on this screen. If you have applied red to absolutely every single thing, that's just you selected everything on your page, all the fonts, all of the backgrounds, and they're all red. Immediately, we can see why we need color, because then this is what your website looks like. It's just a solid block of red. That's not going to work. So then you can use SAS to generate your complementary color, which is just the complement function. All it does is say, take your hue and the HSL, and then just add 180 degrees to it, you're going to get this little cyan color. Suddenly, you have contrast. You have two complementary colors. And this looks terrible, right? Anybody make a website like this when they were like 15 years old and thought, like, this is the best? Um, this is actually what websites look like when kids <laughs> make websites. They really like bright colors. So that's an easy cheat in both painting and in design. If you want something to look really fancy and sophisticated, just tone down your colors. Don't make them so bright. That's like a rookie mistake. Really, really intense saturated colors like this. So we have these two colors, right? We should be good to go, start mixing highlights, shadows, whatever, just right? Not quite. Uh, this is where it gets a little funky. When, when we work in in these color spaces, we're, this is abstracted away. Hex values, not abstracted enough, right? Sometimes when we start working in software right away, it's a little too abstracted. Like, what are we really doing here when we say, uh, okay, find the, the complement to this, right? I, part of the reason that I created this isn't just to give you a tool like, here you go, this spits out some colors for you and you can use them. There are plenty of amazing color picker tools out there that are way better than this. Instead, again, what I'm going to have here is every single thing that I do has a little uh, GitHub gist right underneath it that shows you the actual decisions that I made based, you know, that's written in a function. So here, I mean, just complement and why I did it. Um, we're going to color, establish a color relationship. And this is something I have not seen much uh, in the web world. This is something that is step one in painting. Never, ever work straight from the tube. If you've ever gone to an art store and you've seen all these beautiful, beautiful colors on the wall, you're, you're just going to be like, wow, I want to use blue and green and red and orange. But when you start using them on a canvas, all of a sudden it fills up. And again, it looks like this really just garish, bright, way too intense layout and it doesn't work and then some designer comes over and like, well, let me take over. This isn't going to work. Um, what establishing relationships between colors means is that you mix some of one color into the other and the other, you know, you, you mix them a little bit closer together. And what that does is actually simulate similar lighting conditions. And the way to explain that is, have you ever taken a photo or like a selfie under fluorescent lights and just thought, that's terrible, delete it? Because you look green and weird and just kind of just pale, that's because you're all getting bathed in nice green light. Sure, it's all uniform, but it looks terrible. Or have you ever tried to Photoshop yourself into a picture where all your friends went out and you, just kidding. Uh, if you've ever seen somebody try to Photoshop themselves into another photo, it looks really fake and really weird because it's like, that's, that person's not really there. You're Photoshopping this in, this is fake. And that's because your brain is always, 100% of the time, scanning its environment, trying to figure out what's wrong with this constantly. And if your two colors don't have similar lighting conditions, and it looks like this doesn't belong here, it's going to stand out. You're not going to quite know why, unless you know about this, but it's going to stand out, and it's going to be a little jarring to you. So mixing colors together, just a little blue in this red, a little red in this blue, that's going to just let your brain settle down and say, there's no alarming thing in this environment. Everything here is where it's supposed to be. Move along. Ignore these colors. They're good to go. So that's part of it. It's kind of tricking our primitive brains to just like settle down. Because remember, computers can glow all kinds of colors at us that don't exist in nature in intense ways that don't exist in nature. And I'll get back to that in a minute. Ah, neutrals, finally. So see the difference between these two and how one all of a sudden just feels like you can relax a little bit? Back to our primitive brain. We're not really built like computers. You know, we have one pixel next to the other and it's perfectly separated. We have really, really crappy eyeballs that kind of fuzz over signals and one's going to be sending this signal, it's like, it's blue, and this one's like, it's red, and you're going to get nauseous 
and maybe throw up. That's how you get optical illusions, is that we play around with our terrible, terrible, fuzzy eyes that don't work very well. So when you really think about it, you have the power to make somebody throw up with your terrible designs. Again, that's a lot of pressure, and a lot of developers say, like, that's too much pressure, I'm not going to learn color theory. But a really easy way to get around this is to create neutrals. And what is a neutral color? That's the ugly color that makes all the other colors around it look good. That's the color that's really either pastel, it's mixed, it's a gray, it's just like all the ugly colors that you never actually want to use. If you've ever come across a situation where you have to paint your bedroom color and you go to the store and you pick out all these cool colors, you're like, this is going to be great, and you start painting on the wall and it's immediately just the most bright neon color of all time, that's the same kind of situation. The colors we think look good are not the colors that actually look good. You all, again, have to trick your primitive brain. You have to say, oh, ignore the pretty colors, the best colors that get chosen, and mix neutrals. And that's why Apple was so successful. They have a lot of neutrals, like white and uh, white space. The rule of thumb in painting is if a third of your view area is a neutral, like white, black, tan, beige, then all of the other colors are going to be OK. That's going to be enough space for your eyes not to freak out and for you not to feel nauseous. Um, that's also doubly good for accessibility because some people really just do not do well with jarring colors next to each other. So that's just a kind thing to do. So we create these neutrals. And then, don't forget, HSL has three arguments in it. This is the S in HSL, the saturation. Again, the neutral is really a desaturated color. What if you have a tube of paint in front of you and somebody says desaturate this color and you don't have a function you can use because it's the real world? How do you desaturate a color? Anybody have an idea? Well, you actually just mix complementary colors together. Again, it's like I keep coming back to the same thing. Again, it's back to mixing colors, establishing similar relationships, and canceling each other out. And then you'll have a nice gray, cool gray, warm gray to work with. Um, and it's the same thing. Uh, if you check out how similar these last two look, it's because one is I took red and blue and mixed them together equally, and those are the mixed neutrals. And then in the second part, I just used the desaturate function in SAS. Same thing happened. All it means is that when you take two colors from around the color wheel at 180 degrees apart and you mix them together, you'll get gray and you'll desaturate and it'll look neutral. And no matter what, it'll probably look good. So this is about what it would look like if you then used a, uh, a little bit more contrast and desaturated your colors. Suddenly you have all these like blah blues and kind of grayed out dark blues, but it's going to look really, really good. Because finally, you know those clients who say, make it pop. Right, the, the, the usual, like, give it some zing, make it pop, make it exciting. Um, that's, again, playing around with contrast and saturation. That's the HSL. All you're varying is the H for the hue, the saturation, how bright and intense the color is, and L for the lightness. Um, contrast is how you tell the difference between one shape and, or another, and that's really what this is all about. Because, again, color is not frivolous decoration. It tells you where to look, so we try to find what's different, and you try to seek it out. If you don't want someone to look somewhere, you try to make it not as different as possible. Like, these, work, these blend together. They're basically the same color. They're like a gray. Don't even worry about it. And then you also want to make sure that people have enough white space to where their eyes don't feel horrible looking at your screen. I mean, those are really simple requirements, right? Don't make someone throw up when they look at your screen. Uh, make sure they're looking at the right button, the call to action. Get the brightest one. And make sure that everything else kind of fades into the background. What happens if you get rid of color information entirely? What's left? Well, we can turn everything here to, very slowly, grayscale, which it just won't click, apparently. Let's try it on my local host. Ah, there we go. So we just turned off all the color information. Look at that. That looks fine, right? Color's really not the only thing you're worried about. And that's, that's one of my main points, is like, color is just the H in HSL, right? We have lightness that's really working for us. Like, no matter what, color is light, and you're able to say, like, even if we don't have 
the different wavelengths, we still have the amount of light coming back at you, and this works. This is great, again, for accessibility. People who don't see color or red, green, or any of the other ones, you're doing a good thing here by dealing with uh, lightness. Look at all how different these look. They don't at all. Wow, so if you're just playing around with changing colors on the color wheel for your color scheme, you're not really creating any shape, so where's the menu? <laughs> it's gone. Or the complementary colors are just the same because if you just take out the color information, they're gone. So where's my hello world? Oh my god. This is what I mean by, there are a lot of decisions getting made. So if we turn color back on, you know, you can see there was absolutely stuff there. It's just, that's just the H of HSL. There's so much more to color uh, that you're not considering if you don't know about it. Ugh, I don't really like this yellow though. See, so I have opinions about these things. So at the end of the day, what I'm really trying to do is introduce like all of these things and, and throw all these things at you because uh, designers really have a toolkit of information that they use and there's a lot of kind of almost seemingly random information that's floating around in your heads. And it's a lot like with CSS, right? You just know like, well, the difference between padding and margin, which seems so obvious to you, but then you explain it to somebody who doesn't work with layout and it's like, well, that's pretty random, that's pretty weird. We're used to these peculiarities. Um, just like, for example, just because of how wavelengths work, orange is the most noticeable color to the human eye at high intensities. I guarantee you these are orange and seen from way far away. You can see anybody walking all over Ghent today wearing this because at full lightness, this is the most noticeable color to the human eye. But as soon as it gets, your lightness goes down, the L in HSL goes down, uh, actually turns to blues and purples that are most visible. That's why it looks that way at night. So you can actually look to nature to understand a lot of these things. And the reason everybody has an opinion about design is because that's something we're all really trained to see pretty much right away. We know exactly when something doesn't work or when colors clash, but we don't necessarily have the vocabulary to explain why. Um, and it ends up starting to look like, well, it's just this gut feeling you have, or you can just feel your way to using colors, and that's not, that's not the case. Um, designers are always making a million decisions, and they can always explain why they did something. Like, why is my call to, or my call to action button orange? Well, because the rest of your site is blue, and that's a complementary color, and we know that blue and orange are opposites, so that when everything is a neutral blue around, the bright orange will stand out and people won't have an option, but they'll have to click that button because they'll be drawn to that. It's not just like, oh, because it felt nice to have orange there. Um, you also know things like cool colors recede, and you know that, you know, you know the different concerns about accessibility in terms of the most common type of color blindness is red-green, and some types of red-green color blindness mean that your red is actually perceived as being uh, much darker than other people perceive them, so that red-blue combinations next to each other become problematic, or you don't see a lot of websites with red and green next to each other because, again, those are gonna be like little blocks of invisible to people who don't see color. So remember when I turned it grayscale? It's gonna basically look like that. Um, and then there are also things well past color. If you think like this is kind of cool stuff, that's just like a puzzle to solve, there are texture, there are ideas about like, for example, how do you create the illusion of depth when you have a 2D surface. Again, we kind of solve that in art pretty well. We have monocular distal cues. We talk about how texture affects things. Contrast. Low contrast is perceived as being further behind than high contrast. So if something is really, really oppos opposing, like black and white, is going to be perceived as being in front of something that's like one of these little neutral colors just somewhere in the back. So you're always working with these combinations of factors and you're designing this system of different priorities of things your brain and your fuzzy eyes want to look at. And I think it's pretty cool. You can come up with a whole lot of different ways to use color to make your users look exactly where you want them to do. And again, this isn't anything new. Painters have been doing this for a long time. And one of the greatest examples is, for example, medieval art. Anytime you see any kind of painting uh, of the crucifixion, for example, you can see exactly, you can plot it out in a line where they want their users to look in a painting. This is all stuff that we've, we've learned a lot in art school, and it doesn't seem to have made its way to the internet quite yet. So, except for call to actions being orange, that's really made its 
way very well. Like all buttons are red or orange or you know, bright berry. It's because those are the most noticeable color, just like traffic cones or you know, emergency signs on the street. It kind of follows a similar pattern. Um, but I'm not this crazy art person saying all coders need to learn how to paint. That is the last thing I want. I mean, not really. It would be amazing if everybody painted. That's really fun and relaxing. Uh, but it's this, it, the idea here is that you can learn a lot from other disciplines, and you can learn a lot from, uh, you can stand on the shoulders of a lot of people who have already done this before. Uh, you can't quite grow in a vacuum, and you can't quite you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here, and we certainly don't have to keep working in the hex values that we have now and think, like, this is as good as it gets. Um, I just have to learn how to read these and, you know, F, 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 three, four, five, beautiful color. You know, it just doesn't work. Um, we can make these design patterns from art work perfectly on the web because we have the, H, the HSL color level three color module, uh, we have the color wheel, which is now documentation that you should be able to read. I mean, again, you just kind of look at it, figure out some degrees, and that's the color you want, so that you know, like 60 degrees, that's going to be yellow, um, 360, that's going to be red, and then you can start building systems. And I'm not making this up. This is literally in the spec of the HSL uh, as an answer to RGB as an answer for making color more human readable and as a way for you to be able to build color systems and color patterns more easily. Um, when you combine it with SAS, you have every single thing that you need. You have all the functions that you need that model the real world just like in painting. So you don't have to buy a brush, you don't have to buy a canvas, you don't have to go back to you know, the Renaissance to be able to learn this stuff, or you don't have to dig through 1940s books or watch Bob Ross videos or try to understand the medium. I'm trying to say that it already works now on this medium with SAS, with CSS, with this amazing technology that glows every color we want at us, and we can use it to create whatever kind of experience we want, and we can make sure that our users are looking where we want them to look, clicking where they want to click, and aren't completely lost, or uh, that they can actually see what's going on in the first place. Because the last thing I want to do is make a website that looks like this. So that's it. That is my entire practical color theory for people who code. I really like to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions, because this takes you through a lot of stuff really quickly, and it might seem just as random and overwhelming as when someone's like, listen, come up with some colors and, and just, just make it good, good. I don't care what you do. Uh, but the idea behind this is that it's very predictable, it's very logical, and it's just a pattern just like anything else you would do in programming. And being able to set it up and treat different colors with different considerations um, it's nothing that can't be abstracted into a function and a piece of knowledge that you can look at the code and understand and internalize just like designers have internalized it. Um, my future plans with this is to build this into a more usable library. Right now it exists as an educational tool just to show you the difference between, like here's a color picker that'll do all the work for you, or you're just picking colors at random on a color picker and just kind of hoping your colors work together. Um, but I'm still working through a lot of the concerns that I don't have to think about when I'm working on a canvas when fine art. Things like usability, things like um, parts, you know, user experience and how these colors actually uh, work for the audience, like making sure the contrast is at the right level so that low vision users can use it, and et cetera. So it's going to be a proper library in the future. In the meantime, uh, you can take a look at it online. It's on GitHub, and it's got some explanations of why, why I did something, why I would do something. And this is just an example of a complementary color scheme. You can have a color scheme that is just one color, so it's grayscale with one color. You can have a color scheme that's split complementary, analogous. There are all these things that we've already decided um, that work based on research, based on how our eyes work, and you don't ever have to sit in front of your computer, in front of your project, have the color picker open and just go like, I don't know where to start. I mean, I like purple, I guess. <laughs> um, and then work at random. 
So this is all available. And I also want to mention that there are, there are links to the, uh, the CSS level three color module talking about HSL, which is loading at some point, um, and why you should try to make the transition so that if nothing else, you at least don't become the poor person who <laughs> knows how to read hex values. And you can start working in uh, HSL and starting to understand the patterns that, that come with colors, not just thinking about the hue or just the color and thinking about the saturation and the lightness as well. Because once you consider all three of those, it stops seeming random and it starts being very logical and predictable and something that one day will load over here on this web page. It's something that you can work with um, because how many times have you worked on a project without any documentation? I thought, nah. <laughs> Like you open it up and think like, wow, this is going to be a great tool to use. There's no documentation. You know, I'm, I'm not going to use this. Um, that's, I think, what's happening with color and color theory on the web. There's just not enough documentation. And I'd like to change that. So if anybody has any questions, I'm ready for a question. Unless I really covered everything all four years of high school. Yes. So for generating enough contrast, that is, a, that is probably one of my largest uh, concerns right now because you know, you've got these awesome color schemes that you may really, really like, but then all of a sudden you run it through a test and you're like, that is not going to work for a significant portion of my users. Um, one of the things that I would really say is that in painting and in art, again, this is the parallel that I was, would always draw. One of the and again, if anybody paints in here, you should absolutely do, do this. One of the secrets is anytime you're working on a work of art, um, it's making the cognitive shift between thinking about color and thinking about light, literally the amount of light that's reflected back at you. And I would argue that's much more important. Contrast and the amount of light something is is more important than what color it is. Uh, because anytime you have a composition or a website and you increase the contrast, Odds are it's going to look better, even if you're not trying to, to, to have more contrast for accessibility reasons. If you're working on a painting and you take a picture of it in black and white, and it doesn't look like it has enough contrast, it will be improved and be made much better if you add contrast to it. So um, I guess my worry isn't like, how can I get enough contrast? It's why wouldn't I want the most contrast? Um, contrast is always going to make your, your stuff look better no matter what's going on there. I mean, unless you really want some pastel situation going on, but even then, uh, for your text, for everything like that, you're going to want the most contrast that you can get, you can get away with. Any other questions? So yeah, vary your lightness, like lightness and darkness next to each other. That's how we create shape. That's how we distinguish one thing from another. So if, even if you can't see color, or you don't want to worry about color at all, as long as you make sure that the thing you want to display and the thing next to it that you want it to be set apart from is different enough in, in lightness and darkness, it's going to look pretty good and it's going to work. That's a really safe place to stay. Um, no matter what colors you really pick, here, you know, all these kind of work because there's a lot of contrast. Any other questions? Yes. So that's a really great question, and that's where I think HSL really comes to save the day. Um, with, with something like, okay, you get a hex value for a color, and you just use a color picker on the, on the design, and you realize this doesn't work. Effect, changing that color is a little bit more difficult, because you can't just say, like, keep it this color, but add a little more lightness, or a little bit, make it a little darker. Um, I wrote a function that's basically just increase contrast, so it checks the lightness, 
And then it, here we go, let me scroll to, I actually don't know where I put this in there. Anyway, so I wrote a function that's basically increased light or contrast, which basically checks, uh, is this thing, what's the lightness of this uh, item here? And if it's, you know, higher or lower, you, you, you just, you increase the difference between the lightness of one thing and another thing. That's why up here, when you change these, the little let's get started button, you can see how it changes from white to black. It basically decides, okay, now it needs to be this other color um, based on its background. So uh, if you use, if you ask your designers to use the HSL color space, you'll be able to um, change those and tweak those without really changing the actual color that they chose. Um, but then it's also a bunch of good healthy debate about making sure they can answer why they picked the color that they picked and if they can't answer it. Yeah, so this is actually, I can pull it up in, um, in Sublime here and apparently increase the font a million times. Uh, these variables right here, they're for this whole project, the whole, th I can't see my mouse, the whole thing is really just one set of functions where you pick one color and then the rest get generated from, the, from it. So my, my, I mean, I know how real projects work and that's not really always the best thing to do, but this here is setting up an entire project where you're, like this is a complementary color scheme. You can mess with the percentages inside of all of these, but they're all related. So if you change one color, the rest of the changes repopulate to the rest of the colors. Um, and, and that's kind of a, a much more complicated thing than I would ever really say, like, go nuts on this project. Um, but it actually would work. So for example, if I change this uh, value here to like 215 here, um, and then refresh my local host, which apparently it's just gonna take forever for no reason. Maybe not. <laughs> that makes no sense to me right now. Um, but when I would change this first color, the, the changes would run through all these functions and then my variables at the end would all, all of a sudden be informed by that as well. So this is really what's happening here behind the scenes. It's all happening from one change. So if you wanted to, to say like, well, I really don't want my complementary color to be so chromatic and so intense and so red, you can adjust the hue and change it a little bit here and there, and then the rest of the changes would work, were, were, would work with that. So it's less of a isolated colors getting picked, and then when you change one, you have to then adjust all the other ones. This should do it for you, so that when you change one, the rest of the changes populate. So that it's almost of a much drier way to do this as well, because you, you make one change and then the rest of the color scheme stays intact, because uh, the way it was built was to take into account the different characteristics of the wavelengths and say like, each color has its own characteristics, it needs different treatments, that's why there's a bunch of different percents on all of these. Um, yellow cannot be treated the same way as blue, because they're very, they're different wavelengths, and so I need to make sure the percents are different. Um, so it's, I guess the question here is, could you consider getting your developer, or your designer to start thinking about things in terms of this kind of pattern and how the colors relate to each other? Because again, what I'm really trying to say is, someday in a glorious future, we don't just keep adding colors as these isolated, random, hex values or RGB or whatever, um, but instead build our color partials just like we build the rest of our applications where they're related, where they make sense and one color informs the next one next to it because that's what we do in art all the time anyway. We have color schemes and instead of having these color scheme relationships just live in the designer's head, we can abstract them away, put them in the code and let the computer take care of the rest so that when it's in code, the, the developer can just go ahead and mess with some of the values and it'll still work because the, the foundation here is that the designer's decisions have already been abstracted into code and then the rest is um, just tweaking it and deciding how much contrast you want or how, which colors, you know, do you want your color, a call to action to be red, green, blue, whatever, um, and it should still work. And, and so that's, that's the cognitive shift really. It's not just colors are cool and you can do it, but 
set your color partials and variables up just like the rest of your SAS, where um, when you want to change your color scheme for your site, you can change one value and it'll work. Does that hopefully answer it? <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I think we've got a minute or two. Last call for questions. Awesome. I guess I did a really good job explaining absolutely everything. So, all right, to, to finish this up, um, if you want to see, oh, there it finally reloaded. That's amazing. So, <laughs> this is the part I was talking about. So, if you change it to like 215, for example, it populates the rest of this page and it themes the rest of this page. And all I do is change one color value. So, if I change this to 315, and reload for the next 10 minutes, apparently. Um, it's going to change the rest of the site, and it's still going to work, right? It's, it's just going to give you the same values that you want. Wow, it's really slow. It's probably jet lagged, like me. Um, it's going to have the same rules applying to any color of the color scheme, because a color scheme is really a set of rules applied to all of the color wheel spokes, each of the brightest colors, which are HSL, 0 to 360 at 100% saturation and 50% lightness. If you work with one of those, you can run all these functions and it will generally work. Um, and that's, that's the idea here is set up your colors in a programmatically compatible way so you're not just having to keep all this information in here all the time forever. Yeah, there we go. Now it's purple. So again, it's just going to create this color scheme and populate the rest of your page. So my dream world is one where you can always theme a site in about five seconds and you never ever have a color val value uh, variable named like blue or yellow because if you do that to yourself, you're going to have a terrible time redoing your site. You can just say primary color, complementary color, um, and start using the vocabulary we've been using in art for this whole time. Uh, and start using these relationships and just building them into the program rather than always relying on a designer to generate it for you. I mean, that's the ultimate goal of programming is to not have people do so much work all the time. And I think the color space is one where we can take a lot of uh, work out of the, you know, we can abstract a lot of the work out of des designers' hands so they can think about bigger picture things and entire themes and, you know, they don't have to keep being your manual color picker, they can focus on stuff they really like doing. So I've got five minutes, at which point I can keep scrolling through this or take one more question or talk about my future plans or let you go get some coffee, which might be the right answer here. All right, I think that's it. My name's Natalia. Again, I live in New York. I work on colors. I'm a front-end developer. I also have uh, pictures of cats I paint on the internet. So. <laughs> Those are my main contributions. There's cat themed things, color things, and um, all kinds of fun code stuff that I hope you'll enjoy. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a lovely time at the rest of this conference.